Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here on this day after Christmas. I don't know about you guys, but it looks like Christmas threw up in my house. I've got stuff everywhere, but man, I'm just grateful for time with my family. We made some great memories. I hope if you celebrate Christmas, you did as well. Back to the grind, though. And what we're doing today are some case updates. I've been focused on the Dan Markell case for a couple of weeks now. It was a good time of the year to start this case. Things get a little slow, close to the holidays with the courts, and it's given me time to really dive in. It is a rabbit hole. I've been uploading these jail calls from the week that Charlie was convicted between him and his mother mainly that were of interest that ultimately led to Donna Adelson being arrested at the Miami International Airport trying to go to Vietnam just in the nick of time. They got her. I'm going to be uploading some more today. I'm editing out his son on these calls because there are calls where there are lengthy conversations with Bree, who is the mother of his child. But I don't want to put a little five or six-year-old's voice out there who just wants to talk to his dad. Sad situation for all the kids involved in this case. Terrible choices made by the adults in their lives that have given them a weight they will have to carry around for the rest of their lives. So look for those later. I'm also working to get additional calls from after these. It looks like these calls mainly go to about November the 9th, which is a few days before Donna was arrested. You know, we all want to hear what Charlie was saying after his lifeline, his mom, was behind bars and unable to take his hours-long calls every day. It's insane. I have to give a big thank you to some people that very generously sent me some Christmas gifts. So thank you to Audra, Chris, Audra's mom, Jennifer, Brooke, Rosemary, Miss Ginsburg, and Miss Werner for your thoughtfulness. Really just made my Christmas that much sweeter. Thank you so much. Also, thanks to everybody who's donated and given super chats. It helps me to keep doing what I do. You guys rock. If you want to support the channel, you can do it very easily by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, like the videos, share them with your friends. Music fact of the day. The Guinness Book of World Records has named White Christmas by Bing Crosby as not only the best-selling Christmas song of all time, but also the best-selling single generally of all times with an estimated 50 million copies sold. Some charts have All I Want for Christmas by Mariah Carey as the number one. But Guinness Book, we'll go with them for this one. We are going to jump right in. We're going to talk about Chad Daybell first. Most importantly, Judge Boyce has ordered Tylee Ryan's remains to be released to her next of kin. That would be her brother, Colby Ryan. Her aunt, Annie Cushing, was at trial. I got to meet her. Such a sweet lady and her daughter. And I know that this is a big burden off of all them and everybody who knew and loved Tylee. It's been over four years since the murders of J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, Charles Vallow, and Tammy Daybell. And when you talk about the long road to justice, this is a classic example of that. J.J. Vallow's remains were released last month to his next of kin. Judge Boyce has also ruled that the death penalty will stay on the table for Chad Daybell. His attorney, John Pryor, argued that prosecutors said Lori Vallow was more culpable for the murders at her trial in April of this year and that Chad was facing a more severe punishment for waiving his right to a speedy trial. The cases were severed after Lori wanted a speedy trial, and Chad didn't. Death was taken off the table for Lori as sanctions for late disclosure of discovery in relation to when her trial was going to start, not for anything else. It was a technicality. Otherwise, it would have been on the table for her. The difference in this trial, just a reminder, Judge Boyce has ruled he will live stream Chad's trial the courts will be in control of the cameras better than nothing. In the ruling, Judge Boyce said that the quotes cited by John Pryor were taken out of context and they were incomplete in their presentation. In the ruling, Judge Boyce said that deciding his culpability could impact potential jurors and predetermined facts about the case. Let's dive into his ruling here for just a second. It says, beyond this, however, Daybell overlooks one important consideration. The court cannot and will not speculate about what the evidence at Daybell's trial will be with respect to Daybell's culpability. To make a pre-trial determination about whether Daybell is more, less, or equally culpable to Vallow, who has now been convicted of all charges brought by the state of Idaho, would require this court to invade the province of the jury and make a premature determination about what the facts of Daybell's case, not Vallow's case, are. 
The court declines to do so and finds that this request is not ripe for judicial determination because the state has not yet put on their case against Chad Daybell. Additionally, while the court believes there is likely to be considerable overlap in witnesses and evidence for Daybell's trial, the indictment charges Daybell with separate and additional crimes. Daybell repeatedly argued for his trial to be severed from Vallow, emphasizing the necessity to preserve individualized consideration between Daybell and Vallow. Further, Daybell argued for separate trials with individualized considerations of Daybell and Vallow, given the mutually antagonistic nature of the defendant's positions. The court carefully reviewed the cited authority by Daybell, and the state finds that the case law does not suggest that degrees of culpability are appropriately determined by courts ahead of trial. To do so would defy the fundamental right to a fair trial by a jury of one's peers. Facts submitted at trial may only be considered after the admission of evidence and testimony within the constraints of evidentiary rules. Thus, while Daybell is charged as a co-conspirator on some counts in the indictment, he is nevertheless also charged with first-degree murder for the murder of Tammy Daybell, a crime that is punishable by death. Boom. There you go. So he's the only one that's accused of murdering his wife. Lori had a conspiracy to commit murder charge. Chad had the actual murder charge. Where Daybell alone faces that count, the potential of his conviction for that separate murder, distinct from any of Vallow's convictions, further reveals that a determination of relative culpability is speculative when considered before trial. Therefore, Daybell's argument about relative culpability is not persuasive as a basis to strike the death penalty. Moreover, the point remains, it is the duty of jurors, not this court, to determine the facts of this case, including deliberating about whether the state meets its burden to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Daybell is guilty of the mirroring charges raised against both Daybell and Vallow. Chad's trial begins April 1st of next year in Boise, Idaho. I'm hoping to make it out there, some for the trial, hopefully for openings, maybe some in the middle maybe here and there, and then definitely closings and verdict. So round two, around the same time, right? Lori's trial also set to begin in Arizona for the two conspiracy to commit murder charges for the murder of her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, who was shot and killed by her brother in what was originally ruled a self-defense case until the kids went missing, things started piecing together. Unfortunately, Alex Cox died before he could face justice just the day after Tammy Daybell's body was exhumed for autopsy. And just a little blurb here about the doomsday wannabe brother and sister. Spring Thibodeau and her brother, Brooke Hale, they finally have been extradited from Alaska to Arizona. Just a recap, Spring and Brooke, along with Spring's daughter, took Blaze out of school, tried to take him into the remote wilderness in Alaska in winter of all times, they thought he was chosen to help the second coming of Christ. I think the one thing about the murders of J.J., Tylee, Charles, and Tammy is that maybe Blaze was saved from that same fate because everybody was so much more aware of how dangerous these doomsday beliefs are. And I'm going to keep an eye on that and update you. Moving on to Alec Murdaugh. Here we go. It's just such a convoluted case at this point. There are so many things going on from different angles. But Fitz News is reporting that an evidentiary hearing has been set for Alec Murdaugh. This is in regards to the jury tampering allegations against the Colleton County Clerk of Court, Becky Hill. The hearing is expected to last three days beginning on January 29th. That will be heard in Richland County, which is Columbia, South Carolina. That's the capital of the state. Richland County is about two hours away from Colleton County. Colleton County, as we know, he was tried and convicted there for the murders of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. And a new judge will oversee this hearing as well. Chief Justice Jean Toll, I think it's Toll, T-O-A-L. She held a virtual status conference just two days after being handed the case. By the way, she was the first woman to serve as a justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court. The other thing, Becky Hill's emails from her Colleton County work email address have been released. There are over 2,000 of those. 
I've grazed the surface, but I haven't really dove into those. In a future episode, we're going to kind of break down the meat of these emails, highlighting just some of the more important ones. In other Murdoch news, Neil Gordon, who is the co-author of Becky Hill's book, Behind the Doors of Justice, has spoken out against Becky regarding some plagiarism allegations in her book that were actually taken from a BBC article that was sent to her before it was published. Mr. Gordon said that she did so without his knowledge, and he only found this out after reading through the emails that came with this email dump that was made public. He found an email from February 14th of this year between Becky and a journalist from the BBC where the reporter shared a really long passage for an upcoming article about the trial. Gordon says that Becky forwarded the email to her private account. He said the email mirrored that 12-page part of the book that Becky had supposedly written. Gordon says, when I confronted Becky about this, she admitted she plagiarized the passage due to deadline pressures. As a veteran journalist myself, I cannot excuse her behavior, nor can I condone it. He said he has notified the reporter about this and was told the BBC's media attorney is investigating. He says he has halted sales of the book, although as of five minutes ago, it was still available on Amazon. He said, this is blindsided me. Journalism has been my life's work. My credibility and integrity are paramount to everything I do. I can't be associated with anything like plagiarism and will no longer partner with Becky Hill on any projects. I'd like to apologize to our readers and publicly to the BBC and the reporter. Just seems like every day there's something new. It's a mess, y'all. This is just the never-ending story, it seems. Moving on to Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt. Ruby and Jody were arrested on August 30th after Ruby's son escaped Jody Hildebrandt's house and went to a neighbor's house for help, saying that he had been tied up and abused and he was very malnourished. That was mentioned on the call, as well as the open wounds that the neighbor saw on this young man. Ruby's known for her YouTube channel, Eight Passengers. That channel was started in 2015. And over the life of that channel, they gained 2.5 million followers. Ruby and her husband were often criticized for their extreme punishments on their children. And it really started to backfire in a big way back in 2020 when people became really worried about how strict their parenting was. Viewers of that channel actually ended up alerting authorities about Ruby and her husband. But Ruby and her husband, Kevin, doubled down, slammed the critics who were bashing their parenting style. One punishment included making their teenage son sleep on a beanbag for seven months, all because he pulled a prank on one of his younger siblings. He was forced to sleep on a beanbag. And they also, at times, withheld food as a form of punishment. And in one video, Ruby and Kevin's six-year-old kindergartner forgot her lunch at home because, you know, six-year-olds can't plan their whole day. Can't tell you how many times I took my kid their lunches they forgot. But Ruby refused to bring it to her kid, saying that this was a lesson and she's just going to need to be hungry. She went on to say, hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch because then... She's not going to learn from the natural outcome. In 2022, Ruby stopped posting videos on her YouTube channel and then joined forces with Jody Hildebrandt. That was on Jody's Connections page. Some of the episodes showed the two women downplaying the seriousness of eating disorders, blaming victims of sexual assault, social and political comments that got people all kinds of fired up. Both channels were removed after the women were arrested. Well, what did Ruby do? Pleaded guilty to child abuse charges and will testify against Jody Hildebrandt. In return for her guilty plea, the state said that they would remain neutral at future parole hearings. Ruby was originally charged with six counts of child abuse. As part of her plea deal, two of those were dropped. Before her hearing, her attorney released a statement on Ruby's behalf, which said, Ruby Frankie is a devoted mother and is also a woman committed to constant improvement. Initially, Ms. Frankie believed that Jody Hildebrandt had the insight to offer a path to continual improvement. Ms. Hildebrandt took advantage of this quest and twisted it into something heinous. Over an extended period, Ms. Hildebrandt systematically isolated Ruby from her extended family, older children, and her husband, Kevin. This prolonged isolation resulted in Ruby being subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Hildebrandt's influence. During Ruby Frankie's incarceration in Washington County Jail over the past few months, 
She is actively engaged in an introspection that has allowed her to reset her moral compass and understand the full weight of her actions. Miss Frankie is committed to taking responsibility for the part she played in the events leading up to her incarceration. Demonstrating a sincere dedication to personal growth and rehabilitation, she has actively begun the process by reaching out to members of her family. Ruby is aware that Kevin has filed for divorce. While she is devastated by the news, she acknowledges and understands his anger and reasoning. Despite the pain, she respects his decisions and remains hopeful that, with time, she can contribute to rebuilding trust and fostering understanding within their family. Ruby has offered her full cooperation to help the children reunite with their father. Let's hope he doesn't try to have one of them arrested like he did their oldest. Windward Law recognizes the profound love that Miss Frankie holds for her children, and we are genuinely saddened that she found herself on this challenging path under the influence of Miss Hildebrandt. At the hearing when read the fourth charge, Ruby said, with my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. It is our firm belief that Miss Frankie is a devoted mother who unfortunately was led astray. You know what they say about you could lead a horse to water? Because I'm going to tell you what, I'm not going to sit back while you're abusing my kids and don't throw it all on Jody. You were there. You contributed. May you get what the judge gives. The statement goes on to say she is sincere in her commitment to securing the best possible future for her family, and we remain hopeful that with the right support and understanding, she can navigate a path towards healing and growth. Utah law says that second-degree aggravated child abuse can be charged if that person knowingly or intentionally inflicts serious physical injury to a child or causes or permits another to inflict serious physical injury to their child. Each charge carries a sentence of 1 to 15 years in prison. She is up for at least 60. I hope the judge is very solid and firm and doesn't give her wiggle room. This is years of abuse that's been going on. And the other thing is she's throwing Jody under the bus and going to back over her for good measure. And by the way, this is not the first time that Jody Hildebrandt has been accused of abusing children. Back in 2010, uh, a teenager made a report against Jody that was... Jody was the teenager's aunt, and this child was seeking a safe house to live in. The teen's parents had sent them to live with Jody due to having problems with the kid, and also said that Jody was a licensed clinical mental health counselor. Back in 2010, the allegations against Jody by her family member were that Jody was forcing them to sleep outside in a sleeping bag, and they weren't allowed to speak to Jody because they had told lies before, according to Jody. The teen said that Jody put duct tape over their mouth at some point. They had been wearing the same clothing for weeks. They were not enrolled in school. And the reasoning was that Jody's methods of counseling required this kid to be in her custody at all times. No, nah, she just didn't want the abuse to be public is my suspicion. Officers tried to contact Jody several times. They were unable to reach her. They did speak to the teenager's parents. And the teen's father told officers the child was defiant. And the reason the child was not enrolled in school was because they were looking to enroll them in a wilderness program. The father said the teen was contacting police as a ploy to get out of that. He also said sleeping outside in the sleeping bag was to show what it was like to sleep outdoors. The teen was ultimately taken to a short-term shelter for adolescents, and the case was closed the next day. A few weeks after, Jody reported the teen as a runaway, saying she believed the reason was so the child would not be placed in a program for troubled youth. The teen's mother told police that this was the third time they had run away, and the teen actually sent messages to friends on social media saying, Dude, save me, I'm trapped. The teenager was found over a month later at a shelter for unhoused people in Salt Lake City. When officers made contact, the teenager was visibly upset and was looking around as if they were intending to run. While waiting on grandparents to arrive, they told police that they ran away because Jody was trying to make them confess their sins and tried to break them down. And the teenager told officers if forced to go back to Jody's, they would run away again. In the officer's report, the teen said Jody is some kind of therapist and thinks she has all the answers. But Jody insults me all the time in front of others and acts like I'm evil by not letting me talk to kids or others. There is a backstory to every case I'm doing here. If you have interest in learning more about Jody Hildebrandt and also how she essentially ruined a lot of marriages 
with her counseling services. Have at it. I'll link that playlist in the description. A little trigger warning here. We're going to talk about some of the things in the plea agreement that were revealed about the abuse the kids suffered. And I know some people are sensitive to that. Completely understand, but want to give you a two-second warning to fast forward. In the plea agreement, the abuse was detailed where her son was forced to do hours of physical activities, including wall sits, also carrying boxes full of books up and down stairs. In the summertime, he was forced to work outside without water. He also had repeated and serious sunburns that blistered. Food was withheld, and when he did eat, the meals were plain. He was punished when he was caught drinking water when he should not have been. He was isolated from others and had no access to any books, notebooks, or electronics. He tried to run away in July, but ultimately was caught. As a result, this poor young man's hands and feet were bound frequently and, at times, with handcuffs or ropes. He would be forced to lay on his stomach, lifting his arms and legs off the ground, which in return injured his ankles and wrists. The handcuffs would cut into his skin and it was treated with homeopathic remedies and duct tape placed over the injuries. Her son told authorities that cayenne pepper and honey were placed on open wounds. That is evil. Ruby admitted to kicking her son while she was wearing boots, holding his head underwater, and covering his mouth and nose with her hands. She would try to convince her son that he was evil and possessed and needed to repent. He was told he could avoid the punishment by obedience. And in the plea agreement, it says that her son suffered severe emotional harm and was told the abuse were acts of love. Ruby's nine-year-old daughter also was a victim. She was forced to work outside, run on dirt roads barefoot, and go without food. Also, no water, causing her severe emotional harm. The child's feet had been repeatedly injured, and those wounds were evident by scabs, blisters, and sloughing skin when she was found. She, too, had had those repeated sunburns. She was repeatedly told she was evil and possessed, and the punishments were necessary for her to be obedient and repent, and also that these things were being done in order to help her. The girl was convinced what her mother said was true. It's so sad. Sentencing for Ruby will be on February 20th of 2024. Again, faces up to 60 years in prison. Those sentences will be served consecutively which means one after the other, not at the same time. Jody's next court date is actually set for tomorrow, December 27th. Ruby's oldest daughter, Sherry, opened up on Instagram about her mother pleading guilty, saying she has mixed emotions this holiday season. She posted a couple of photos, one of her in front of a Christmas tree as a young girl, and then a current one of her as a grown adult. She said, the holidays are full of mixed emotions for me. I'm so grateful for all the memories I have to hold on to, as pictured above. And I also look forward to memories I know I can create. Have your traditions changed as you've gotten older? I hope these kids are getting a lot of therapy and starting to realize that the problem was with Ruby and Jody and not them. Moving on to Brian Koberger, accused of killing University of Idaho students Ethan, Zana, Kaylee, and Maddie in November of last year. The judge denied the defense motion to dismiss that indictment. The judge said that grand jurors saw enough evidence to find probable cause to believe Koberger committed those crimes. Now, the house where the killings took place is set to be demolished in two days, beginning on December 28th at 7 a.m. It's expected to take several days. Media will have access to view the demolition. The University of Idaho president, Scott Green, said the house is a grim reminder of the heinous act that took place there. While we appreciate the emotional connection some family members of the victims may have to this house, it is time for its removal and to allow the collective healing of our community to continue. So far, there are no plans on what the lot will be used for, but Jody Walker, who is the Executive Director of Communications for the University of Idaho, said removing the house is helpful for the healing process for the Vandal community. He also says it will be turned back to green space for the moment. Then later, decisions can be made down the line of what to do with the grounds long term. Just this past semester, students in the university's art and architecture program have been working on concepts. I was listening to an attorney who's not affiliated with this case, and I could not find his name, but it was a really good point made. Let's just say they did this 3D Pharaoh scan of the inside and outside of the house. 
that's where it essentially looks like it did at the time the scans were taken. But what if for some reason that Faro scan cannot be brought into the trial? Then you're relying on people's recollections and their memories. It's a traumatic time. People may not remember every little thing, and I liken it to putting toothpaste back in the tube once you squeezed it out. You can't reconstruct this house. We don't even have a trial date yet. I think it's risky, but Kaylee's family released a statement through their attorney, whose name is Shannon Gray, and it says, let us ask this. Is it better to have the King Road house and not need it than need the house and not have it? That has been our question to the prosecution and the University of Idaho for the entire time the demo of the King Road residence has been an issue. But why is it even up for discussion? This is one of the most horrific crime scenes in the history of Idaho, and the University of Idaho wants to destroy one of the most critical pieces of evidence in the case. And it's also important to make note that there is now a demolition date before there's even a trial date set. This alone speaks volumes. It is obvious from the two recent visits to the house by both the prosecution and the defense, there is still evidentiary value in having the King Road house still standing. There may be additional discovery by either party that prompts one side or the other to go back to the scene of the crime. There has always been a dialogue about the 3D imaging or they are building a model to replicate the home, etc. First and foremost, what a waste of state money and resources. And secondly, nothing replaces the real thing. Jurors are notoriously unpredictable and they tend to make decisions on a variety of facts and circumstances. It would be foolish of us to try and foresee what they will want or need to make a just verdict in this case. The family has stressed tirelessly to the prosecution and the University of Idaho the importance, evidentiary and emotionally, that the King Road House carries, but nobody seems to care enough. It's like screaming into a void. Nobody is listening. Everyone is telling you how sorry they are for the decision, but the family's opinion isn't a priority. Victims' families have a voice and should be heard and listened to. On the flip side, Ethan Chapin's mother is okay with the house being torn down, saying we are supportive of the decision to take down the King Street house for the good of the university, its students, including our own kids, and the community of Moscow. Remember, Ethan was a triplet, is a triplet, he's still a triplet, uh, but their other two kids still go to the University of Idaho. His brother is a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity, which you can see from the frat house to where his brother was brutally murdered. So I understand their position as well. It's a tough one, but ultimately, I think it's very risky. Just a reminder, his trial was originally scheduled to begin in October of this year, but he waived his right to a speedy trial in August. Prosecutors have now asked that his trial begin in the summer of 2024. They would like to use this time frame so that the trial would be held while college students are home for summer break, as well as local high schools being out for summer. The state says Moscow High School is directly adjacent to the courthouse premises and already the significantly increased amount of media and other vehicles related to this case have strained available parking as well as safety and convenience for pedestrians, including students. The state also says having the trial at a time with college and local schools on break would give more availability to have local accommodations. Since it's not infrequent for area lodging to become unavailable during school times due to university-related activities such as sporting events, graduations, things of that nature when college is in session. You know, I think this summer trial date possibly is a great idea because not only is it accommodations and, and all that stuff? But these students are going to be subjected to a media circus coming to town. This case has been covered internationally. Having covered the Alec Murdoch trial earlier this year and then Lori Vallow in the spring, there are a lot of media outlets there. That could be a distraction to these students. So I do think summer is probably a wise choice. They anticipate the trial is going to last around six weeks. That would include the sentencing phase. It's a death penalty case. They've asked to set the court day to last from 8.30 a.m. to around 3 p.m., which would give jurors time to handle their business due to how long they're going to have to commit to be on this jury. Attorneys asked the judge last week to schedule a hearing to establish deadlines for both the state and the defense to file any outstanding documents in relation to their proposed time frame of a summer trial. This would mean discovery, witness lists, jury instructions, pre-trial motions, all that good stuff would be due by a date 
determined by the judge to coincide with a possible summer trial. The state is also asking the judge to deny any more chances for Koberger to file an alibi notice. Two deadlines have passed for the defense, and the state says that Koberger has already been afforded this opportunity. Back in August, the defense objected to the motion to compel for an alibi for the night of the murders. They responded that Koberger was taking a drive alone that night, which they said he has a habit of doing going on drives alone. In the filing, it says Mr. Koberger is not claiming to be at a specific location at a specific time. At this time, there is not a specific witness to say precisely where Mr. Koberger was at each moment of the hours between late night, November 12th, 2022, and early morning, November 13th, 2022. That was filed in August. So we'll see what happens. I guess as of now, this house is going to be demolished in two days. There was a change.org petition to get the courts to reconsider tearing it down. But so far, looks like it's still on. We are going to move on to Delphi. Just a really quick update. Richard Allen is accused of murdering Abby Williams and Libby German seven years ago. The Supreme Court arguments in Delphi will be live streamed on January 18th. The arguments to be heard at that are whether or not to reinstate his prior defense attorneys and also whether or not Judge Gull should be taken off the case. The Supreme Court ruled on December 11th, denying a request from Richard Allen, who wanted the court to order the judge to make certain documents public and also to follow state rules about sealing court records. The ruling also said that Judge Gull's ruling about that had covered most of their arguments raised and clarified the process for sealing court records. So that's it for today. I still need to do another update episode on Brooks Hauk. There's been another arrest, some developments, a few other cases. Look for that later in the week. Tomorrow, we'll pick back up on the Adelson deep dive. Also, later tonight, I'll be putting out a jail call, kind of getting towards the end on those, but working on more. Appreciate all you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Hope you have a good rest of your evening. We'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.